Disclaimer. Please check your playback settings. Ensure you are listening to this podcast at normal speed. Unless you want us to sound drunk. Then play at half speed. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, really, thank you for helping me out on this unopposed campaign. It is still an honor to know that I am the chosen one. So what now? I, I don't know. You know, I'll be honest, I really wasn't expecting to lose. Well, I mean, for me, it almost worked out how I wanted it to. You and Tom lost. <laughs> Fuck you right back. I'm a little surprised Peggy won, though. I still doubt she's real. Josh, we're looking at her. She's right there. Still not convinced. You know, now that I think about it, maybe. Well, maybe. Yeah, I got nothing, guys. Hmm. I, uh, I may have written her in on the ballot. Really? Like, really? I figured you guys would vote for yourselves. Honestly, I didn't realize it was the same Peggy on the ballot. Wait, did you guys vote for her, too? <clears throat> My vote is none of your business. But yes. So, um, I guess we all voted for her then? You know, honestly, now that it's over with, I'm kind of glad I didn't win. Campaigning was exhausting. Yeah, I really hated going out and trying to talk to people. You left the house? I only made a few posts online, and boy, oh boy, that was a mistake. Yeah, one time, big mistake, never again. I bought some ads, and then I uh, told my parents. You know, this is starting to make more sense. <laughs> yeah, it is, and all I know is that we're going to have to, uh... Where the hell did that phone come from? I thought you brought it. No. Uh, hold on, it's right here, I got it. Hello? Uh, I, I mean... Uh-huh. What, I, I... 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 Okay. Okay, uh, sure? Yeah. Bye. Who was that? Oh, that was Peggy. Who? Oh, that's nice of her to call. What did she want? The scripts for next week's show. By Thursday. Is she your boss? What the hell office are we running for? I have no idea anymore. Yeah, let's watch a movie, guys. Not only are we taking Jake Martell to Midnight Special America, but we're going to take Kirsten Dunst to Wag the Dog, and then Willie Nelson to Swing Vote, Dennis Harper to Cool Hand Luke, George Kennedy to Flight of the Phoenix, then all the way to Jimmy Stewart to Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Yeah! Grab your tiny flags and hop on the bandwagon, because we're hitting the campaign trail. Join Dan, Tom, and Josh on their whistle-stop campaign trail. Shaking hands and kissing babies all the way to Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Ask not what the fire pit can do for you. Ask what you can do with the fire pit. Mr. Smith goes to Washington is a significant picture. It is significant because it emphasizes democracy in action. I consider it a real privilege and a real experience to have played even a minor part under the distinguished direction of Frank Cutler. By far the greatest picture of filmdom's top director, three-time winner of the coveted Academy Award, the most timely, the most vital, the most significant picture ever to come out of Hollywood, a homespun boy and a hard-boiled, worldly-wise girl in a picture carved out of the everyday lives of everyday Americans, with those inimitable Capra overtones of drama, laughter, and romance, plus the finest supporting cast ever assembled. Good evening, uh, bots and listeners. Well, welcome to the Fire Pit. I'm Josh, parliamentary name Reginald, and tonight we're... Uh, uh, um, hello? Yeah? Uh-huh. Of course. Okay. Thank you. Who was that? Peggy? Again? What does she want now? Nothing. She just told me to speak more confidently. Is she listening to us live? I guess. Um, anywho. Evening, bots and listeners, and welcome to the fire pit. I'm Josh, parliamentary name Reginald. And tonight, 
We are on the last stop of the Whistle Stop campaign trail to Washington. After an exciting campaign of chases, votes, prison breaks, and scandals, we finally escaped on a makeshift aircraft and now coast into Washington. And as per our rules, we've taken an actor or actress from our last film and moved them to this one. And now, to tell you who we're watching and what we're watching, I'm going to go ahead and toss this microphone over to you, Thompson. Well, thank you. Oh, hang on. I got to get this. Yo, hoi, hoi. Oh, um, okay. I, I think I could try that. Oh. You know, I haven't been doing this for that long, right? All right, I'll give it a go. Think, thanks. I, she, they hung up. Peggy again? Yeah, she wants me to edit more sound effects and stuff in. She thinks it's funny. Seriously, Peggy, who? Josh, you just spoke to her. Moving on. Hello, I'm Tom. Parliamentary name, Thompson. And after escaping prison with Dragline himself, George Kennedy in Cool Hand Luke, we escaped the desert on a model airplane with him and a few flying cats in the flight of the Phoenix. However, George wouldn't have made it far without a pilot played by none other than Jimmy Stewart. Ah, Harvey! who we will watch tonight in not just one of the best roles, or his best roles, but what is widely regarded as one of the all-time classics, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, the 1939 movie featuring the very young Jimmy Stewart as he plays the naive Senator Jefferson Smith, who goes to Washington and is met with all the amazing fun and frivolities and patriotism that politics can provide. And to provide us a rundown on this penultimate classic, I proceed to turn things over to Nigel. Thank you, Tom. I'm Nigel, Senate name Dan, and as mentioned by both my colleagues, we're finally here. We're finally at Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, the oldest film we've watched, and our first black and white film. And oh, hold on, I gotta get this. Hey, Peggy. Hey, Dan. Wah, 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 wah. I mean, I, I, I yeah, I get, I can't. Yeah, I can't. Sure. Uh, thanks. Wah, wah. <laughs> Uh, what what now? Uh, she was wondering if I'd put some more random facts in the rundown. Uh, she said the uh, random facts about the films are a nice touch to the podcast. How is she listening? I have no idea. And it's best not to think about that too much. Anyways, yeah. Uh, as I was saying, this is our oldest film by far. And it was a difficult road to get to this film. But from the looks of things, and judging by what we watched on this road, it was well worth it. I mean, <laughs> Jimmy Stewart. Come on. Anyways, this movie was released on October 17th, 1939, so we just missed its anniversary. Um, it has a running time of 125 to 130 minutes. I guess it depends on the release that you get. It had a budget of supposedly $1.5 million, which was a lot of money in 1939. And it made a box office of about $9 million. Now, again, this movie's 1939, so box office figures are kind of hard to find. I couldn't tell if that $9 million was during its actual theatrical run or if it was over the years as it was re-released into theaters. Because it just, I don't know. It feels like $9 million for one movie to make in 1939 is a lot of money. Yeah, like, considering the Three Stooges not too long before this film was made were making on average about 500 bucks a movie or something like that. Yeah, this yeah. must have been huge. Yeah, like I said, it was a good movie. It was a popular movie. It was definitely a success when it came out in 1939. Got a Rotten Tomato score of 98%. So got an IMDb of... Nine out of ten. So, I mean, it's a classic in every sense of the word. It's a good film. The funny little bit about it was uh, it was actually, at the time it was released, bitterly denounced by Washington insiders who were incredibly angry at the allegations of corruption in the movie and politics. Um, yet this politics movie... Politics never. I know, right? But uh, the movie was actually banned in Nazi Germany, which was a thing in 1939. Nazi-controlled Italy which was a thing in 1939, and the Soviet Union, because it actually showed that democracy works. <laughs> so the movies were banned in those states. I think it was also banned in Spain, which was somewhat or 
mostly fascist controlled by the late 30s. So, yeah, it was banned in almost every fascist state in Europe and, and a few of the communist ones, too, like uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, another little lovely bit on this movie, because it's so old. There's a scene in the movie where Jimmy Stewart's character first arrives at Washington and he's all amazed at all the monuments and stuff. That footage was stolen because at the time the U.S. Park Service denied photo permission to film near him because they knew that war was looming and they didn't want people painting specific targets. So photos and movies were forbidden to be filmed anywhere near any of the monuments or the White House in Washington. And yet they like did stealth camera stuff, which was actually kind of amazing that they were able to do that in 1939, because if anyone knows anything about camera technology, they weren't exactly small in the 30s. So they weren't like on your phone where you could just go stealth mode and, and film some things incognito. So I'm just imagining a, like a dude like hiding behind a bush with what is essentially a gigantic box the size of his torso. Yeah, I was actually thinking of like a, a camera that they had a trench coat over and they made it look like it was walking and it was just like a thing in a trench coat. And uh, <laughs> so it was just this camera and it had a fedora on and all that. But So what just... you got there? Oh, just uh, some weather equipment. Yeah. Uh, like... Storm's coming in tonight. It's a clear yeah. night out there, sir. Yeah. What was Who's your name? Who's your friend? Emmett Brown, doctor. <laughs> Who's your friend? Who's your friend? Uh, Cam? Oh, okay. He don't talk much, does he? No, Cam ain't much one for talking. So I did uh, some but... back of the napkin math with inflation regarding to 1939 money. Apparently mm-hmm. $1 from 1939 is worth about $18.73 today. So okay. $1.5 million would be a, uh, equitable to 28 million dollars in today's money. So the $9 million would be equal to about $168 million. So Whoa. you're looking at $28 million, uh, budget to $168 million return. That's not bad for a film that was mostly banned in most of Europe at the time and also intensely controversial. Yeah, not to mention released still during the Great Depression. The Great Depression is still very much a thing in 1939. So. Mm-hmm. Probably not as bad as it was in the mid to early 30s, but it was still very much a thing. Like, people need to remember that it was actually World War II that brought us out of the Great Depression, and that doesn't happen for another two years. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I'm but, really looking forward to this movie because it's, like, controversial in 1939. 2020 would like to have a word. Well, <laughs> well, Josh, since you said that you're looking so much forward to this movie, uh, let's get your expectations on it. That was an amazing and beautiful segue, Dan. Thank you. I tried. Just, just, that was, that was mm. But uh, yeah, okay, so I want to say I've seen parts of this movie. Um, enough to know that I really enjoyed it, but I saw it when I was really, really young. So um, I don't have any major recollection of this movie. Um, and I don't think it's going to be in regards to how I watched uh, like Stand By Me and older movies like that. Mm-hmm. Or that I did see them, I just forgot that I saw them. I don't really think I'm going to remember much about this movie, but I know I've seen bits and pieces of it. And I hope I'm not just thinking all black and white movies are the same. So um, Tom, edit that out. (laughs) But uh, I'm really looking forward to this movie. I haven't read much on it. So if I am remembering that I haven't seen it, I don't. But it'll be nice because especially hearing Tom talk it up, I'm looking forward to a fun, wholesome movie. And again, I love Jimmy Stewart. So I'm just looking forward to seeing a young Jimmy Stewart. It was thing, you know, because I think the oldest Jimmy Stewart movie I have seen is well, Flight of the Phoenix now. <laughs> so, yeah, I got pretty high expectations for this film, given that it is a destination film. And Tom speaks fairly highly of it. And usually when Tom hates a movie, I like a movie. But when Tom likes a movie, I usually like it, too. Yeah, I'd say my expectations are pretty high on this one. Like, not like overhyped, but I would say that, yeah, I'm pretty excited to watch this movie tonight. Yeah, trust me, Josh, I am not leading you wrong on this one. The world is not leading you wrong on this one. There is a very good reason why this film is still so highly regarded and highly recommended, Uh even a hundred years after it was made. This will be, I think, my third time seeing this. I own this film. It's still prescient. It's still relevant to this day. And I've been looking forward to this destination since this was but a glimmer in my eye. One of those films I've always wanted to show as many people as possible, not just for the optimistic tone, but just we can see the world today still in this. And you know that... You know, as long as there are people like Jimmy Stewart out there fighting for these lost causes, it's 
going to turn out all right. But for those that you know that have never seen this, I'll just to give you like a kind of a background, this was directed by Frank Capra from It's a Wonderful Life. It happened one night. Mr. D goes to town. In fact, this was technically supposed to be a sequel to Mr. Deed Goes to Town. It was going to be Mr. Deed's Goes to Washington. But um, I think Gary Cooper was in that one. And Gary Cooper couldn't play the role, which actually did cause a little bit of drama. But I'll get into that later. It was written by um, Sidney Buchanan, who wrote Cleopatra, which is like one of the benchmarks of 1960s blockbuster ex- historical extravaganza and everything else like that. And he had worked with Frank Capra before, too. So all of these people have worked together in some capacity. So everyone's familiar with one another. They did extensive research and details to make this film. They went to Congress and made a pretty much a one to one one scale of the Senate floor. It's just based on photographs and everything they'd see. It was almost pitch perfect. They'd got so many people to help out on it and the care and consideration. And this was before Capra started taking a cynical turn with all of his stuff. So he still had that optimism like, yeah, stuff sucks, but it's worth fighting for and you can win in the end. And that's what I'm looking forward to in this. Just Jimmy Stewart bringing it. Young, smiling Jimmy Stewart. So for you, Josh, I think you would remember seeing this. And I'm glad you're going to see this for the first time. Nigel, you have you seen this before? I can't remember if you said you had or not. Or had it been a while? Uh, it's been a while. The last time I remember seeing it, it was on my parents' TV when I was still living with my mom and dad. But I've, I mean, I've watched parts of the movie a lot over over the years. I've seen the filibuster scene a hundred times if I've seen it once. Because, I mean, that's not just a classic scene in this film. That's a classic scene in American cinema history. I mean, it's right up there with King Kong on the Empire State Building. It, it, I mean, it's up there with all those classic scenes in cinema. In fact, it's... I would say... The filibuster scene from Mr. Smith Goes to Washington or the scene in um, It's a Wonderful Life where after he's realized that the world is better with him in it and he's running down the street saying hallelujah and waving to everybody. I think those are probably Jimmy Stewart's two most classic scenes. Like when you think of Jimmy Stewart, you think of those two scenes, either the filibuster scene from this movie or the scene in A Wonderful Life. But I don't remember seeing some of the bits and pieces of this movie. So I'm really looking forward to seeing it maybe for the first time all the way through. Definitely never seen the um, quote-unquote video version of this movie. I've only ever seen it on television, on Turner Classic Movies or something like that. So it's been interrupted by commercials and been condensed down for television and stuff like that. So I'm looking forward to seeing the actual video version of this film. And it's a classic, and I love Jimmy Stewart, and I can't wait. And a lovely little random bit of trivia from this movie is apparently Frank Frank Capra all through his life or the rest of his life got letters from people saying that this movie inspired them to go into politics and judging by the state of politics in America today, none of them got the message. So, uh, (laughs) well, this is what happens when you don't show a film like this. You know, this is a film that needs to be re-released every two to four years, just so people can be reminded. (laughs) Exactly. Cause it, it is a good movie. It's a good movie and it has a good ending and it's, it's a feel good movie. And I think it's a, I don't know. It, it's kind of an interesting snapshot of America at this time. It's, it's 1939. Something's going on in Europe, <laughs> you know. Um, and we're like, uh, okay. And there's stuff going on in Asia. And we're like, um, okay. And then here in America, we're going through the Great Depression. We're still, we're still in the Great Depression. And we're trying to claw our way out of it. And at the time this movie was released, a lot of people had lost faith in a lot of politics in America because of the Great Depression. You know, the Great Depression wasn't caused by people working or whatever. It was caused by politicians making bad decisions. So, wait, um, no, that's good thing we got over that. I tell you what. Guys. Yeah. I'm so glad they don't make bad decisions anymore. Tom edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, anyways, I'm just saying, I'm looking forward to this film. I can't wait to watch it. Yeah, I want to say I have seen the uh, filibuster scene where he's just all ragged and torn up and just sitting there screaming horse on the set yeah, floor or whatever. Yeah, it's a classic scene. It's like, mm-hmm. I think it's like 15, 20 minutes of filibuster scene. You feel for him by the end of it, guys. It's rough for Jimmy. You gotta bless him for holding on. So yeah. I'm yeah, not so- going to talk anymore about that because... We got to yeah. get so, to it. He also apparently ad-libbed the whole thing. 
Oh, he poisoned himself essentially too for that. He took some like bicarbonate sodium and like did some other shit to his throat. It's like, dude, you try to like kill yourself for this scene? Just pretend you've been talking for five hours. You're an actor. Don't kill yourself. We need you. So he put baking soda down his throat? Pretty much. But, well, uh, you don't want to eat it, but it's still more of a base. Sodium bicarbonate. <laughs> you know, I, it does kind of irritate me that the people of 1939 get fantastic political films like Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, and we get Swing Vote. Yeah, but we also get... Yeah, I got nothing, guys. Yeah, we, we got swing vote. We got swing <laughs> yeah, vote. We are we're we got screwed, guys. We got and so screwed. Speaking of getting screwed, uh, yeah. somebody got screwed out of winning trivia for the last like a hundred weeks, and uh, I think he's got some trivia for us tonight. So, Tom, the stage is set. It's all yours tonight. You better not fuck this up. So I hope you guys are wearing your brown pants, cause. Shit's about to get real. Oh, God. Welcome back to the Tom Quiz. Dan, I blame you for this. I, I, no, no, no. You got the gimme question wrong. No, you had the quiz that Tom won. This is your fault. This is not my fault. This you is your had... fault. It's both of your faults for underestimating me. I have both the electoral and the popular vote behind me. And now I get to unleash upon you the same quiz I've done before a hundred times. This okay. is there's... this is my fault. This is my fault. I'm sorry. This is bad. You should feel bad. I do. All right, Tom, give it to us. Oh, I'm going to give it Re to you, Josh. Return to formula? Hey, you all came up with fancy quizzes involving backstories and trivia and actual, you know, knowledge. It's like, sometimes you just, I mean, we know how we think of this film, for those who have seen it, and what we hope to get out of this film. But it gives us good context going in to know what other people have thought of this film. So I have found on IMDb the most... What's the word I'm looking for? Impartial, well-spoken reviews on their 1 to 10 scale. And I picked a couple of them. I'll be giving you guys five. I'll give you one or two lines from each of them. And it'll be up to you to guess between 1 and 10 what they rated the movie. Person who's closest gets a point. Person who gets it on the money gets two points. And if there is a tie, well, you can just bribe me. I'm like one of those online games. I'm pay to win, baby. Josh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, but I'm doing it again if I win. Uh, I don't forgive you. Burn in hell. <laughs> Off to a great start already. So I'm going to give you guys an easy one here. First one comes from Equinox042, who said, Overall, this is a good movie. This movie receives a rating of 8 out of 10. Josh, I'll let you guess first. <laughs> 8. Dan? Also 8. I'll both give you a point. It's 5. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> Wait, wait. I thought wait. it was going to be something like that. Wait, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, wait, wait, wait. You broke Dan. I, I don't, I'm, I'm so confused. This says this movie gets a rating of 8 out of 10, and yet he rated it a 5. Is this Joe Biden, Matt? No, I'm just, I'm wondering, like, is this one of those situations where 22 goes into 47? It's possible. They might at least be working. twice. So if the 22 goes into 47 at least twice, then you take the 8, and then you double that and remove it. That okay, would Josh five, is getting right? into math. Okay, Josh is getting good math, and that's forbidden in this, so I'm actually going to take a point away from Josh. So, Dan, you get the point. That I'm still, uh, is not I'm, in the rules. I'm still very confused here. I'm... <laughs> My mother already hates this quiz, Tom. Yeah, yeah she, yeah. she is very disappointed in you. Yes. And you don't know what it's like to see my mother disappointed in you. To any new listeners that started on this episode with us... We're sorry. We're sorry. Very sorry. Join our Discord. <laughs> I just lose his a point, so you're back to tied to zero. 
both of you. Just, will you get to All the right. next question, please? Okay. You gotta well, stop dragging it out. God damn, Tom. It's been a while. Let me have this. I'm like Nevada right now. This is my first chance to be in the spotlight. Let me have this. So, next one comes from Bevo13678, who says, A eh, funny movie. There's a good bit in it where a bloke by the name of Smith goes to Washington. I'm going to say 7 out of 10. I'm going to go 8 out of 10. And Josh gets it. This was the 10 star review. That was his entire review, by the way. Wow. <laughs> right? So Josh is up by a point. So uh, let's see. let's go with this one. This one comes from Angel Peter, who says, Gene Arthur was lovely and played very well. Jimmy Stern had better been replaced by Gary Cooper as in Deeds. Essentially saying that uh, Smith's role would have, or Stewart's role would have been better if um, Gary Cooper had played it. So, Josh, I think you get this one now. I'm going to go six. Nigel? I'm four out of ten. Nigel gets a point. This was the one-star review. Oh, wow. There were only two one-star reviews for this film. So um, the user that wrote this review that uh, Mr. Smith would have been better played by Gary Cooper, um, was he banned from IMDb after this? He probably should have been. Okay. Or he well, just it was a, written in 1952. Or, yeah, it might have been written by Jean Arthur herself. She was not a fan of Jimmy Stewart's uh, performance in this film. He thought he wasn't manly enough. So, I mean, what can you do? It was a different time. I hate film critics, says the guy who does a movie podcast. <laughs> we don't review it. I'd have to say I give this a 7 out of 10. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this film deserves an 8. Gives it a 5. <laughs> So next one comes from Dunmore underscore Ego, who puts very succinctly, politicians are whores. This we know to be fact. I think Nigel gets this. Five yes. out of ten. No, six out of ten. Six out of ten. I want to go seven out of ten. Nigel, you almost had it right on the money. It's a five out of ten. Oh, I almost went under two. I was just like, oh, no, no, no. good job, Nigel. Yeah, nice. thank you. I totally just... Pull that out of my uh, yeah, but just pull that out of my hat is what I did. Better your hat than your ass, I'd say. Exactly. So, what's the score now? Okay, so it's three Dan to two. Yep, three to two. We've got one more question to go. So this one comes from Rmax three zero four eight three two, who says, "Boy, do we ever need a refresher course in this subject? Two thousand six has been quite a year worth studying in some detail." Uh, um, I'm gonna go eight out of ten. I'm uh, the review was about 2006 has been a study. There have been or, quite a year worth studying in some detail. Uh, I will say, what did you say, Josh? Eight. I will say a. I'll I'll go six again. Six out of ten. Oh, Josh gets it. It's a nine star review. Ooh, we are tied up. All right, all right, all right. I think this right. is the first time we go into the tiebreaker. This is. So, okay, so the bidding starts at $100. Don't be afraid to uh, break out those checkbooks, guys. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and knock Tom's... Uh, do I do the blackmail, the extortion, or do I do the uh, bribery there, Dan? Uh, I would go bribery. Okay. I will give you uh, preferred speeds on the uh, Plex server there, Tom. Well, that would be great if my internet wasn't shit, Josh. So, you know what? Let's just do a question. Okay, so... Oh, where did you go? I had a good one as a backup. Okay, so this one comes from Simon Wilson 2, who said, I watched it as part of my politics course at university, and I found myself thinking, why was this brought out? And then I realized, I hate patriotism. That's his actual review? Well, he, he had a little bit more to it. I'm just saying he that made, was in his review. <laughs> that was in his review. He even actually, I'll add a little bit more. He said, in fact, I'll admit, I didn't watch it all. I walked out of the lecture simply because I felt insulted. Wow. Well, one, he says university instead of college. So I'm going to say either Brit or Canadian. Well, who gets Can to he, answer this one first? You uh, do. You do. Okay. I'm no, going to go. Yeah, yeah. 
I'm gonna go four out of ten. I'm gonna say two out of ten. On the money, Nigel! It is a two-star review, and from out of nowhere, All right, Georgia... I want, to I want to sue Tom to stop counting before he adds that. Um, <laughs> nope, the, uh, the count is nope, in. No, nope, uh, I'm going to sue you to stop the count, because I don't like it. I, I don't like that, that results. And I demand you stop counting right before you add that in there. You know what? The, we, the jury, find you in favor. We will stop the count at five to three. Dan wins. The count is it's a to recount. <laughs> okay. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three. Yep. I will not concede. <laughs> All right. Well, it's going to be fun for the next quiz, I guess. Nigel, you continue back on course in your quiz roll. Excellent. Excellent. I have now become drunk with power, and I must be stopped, but I won't be. Josh, what did you do again? I need to stop losing. <laughs> you guys need to write better quizzes, damn it. <laughs> well, Tom, quiz were... Tom did the quiz we always used to do. Yeah, but Tom does it, it's terrible. We do it, it's fine. That's how it works, right, Tom? That is science. Yeah. I mean, that's just science, and science is irrefutable. Yep, this is true. This is true. You know what I have to say to that? <laughs> Shit, hang on, I gotta get this. Hello? Tom, play the music. My fellow Fire Pitians, welcome back to another patriotic episode of The Fire Pit. I am, as always, your interspersal host, editor, and presidential spokesperson, Tom. And the elected Peggy wants to assure you that the state of the podcast has never been stronger, except for maybe yesterday. Yesterday was pretty gnarly. Not our best day, if we're being honest, but today, right on point. And thank you for riding this trail through the Whistle Stop campaign trail. Through scandals, spin, and time served, we finally made it all the way with Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. The election is done, and we finally have our winner. Now let's peek in to see how our team is handling these new results and this new administration. So anyways, um, I'm looking at this thing, guys, and I don't remember seeing my name on the ballot. Me either. Wait, you guys didn't fill out your applications? There were like petitions that people needed to sign, paperwork to file, fees to pay? Seriously? I was not aware of this. No. You know, come to think of it, Josh, I didn't see your name on the ballot either. Yeah, about that. I kind of didn't do it. The application or the signatures? Yes. Awesome. So none of us were even on the ballot? It seems that way. Buy a computer from Rob's Custom PCs. I'm sure they'll adjust to the new leadership. But if you have any recommendations or feedback for our new elect or her administration, or if you have anything for us, feel free to email us at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. That's curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. Be sure to put fire pit in the subject line, as well as what you're emailing about. Whether it's an ad, a question, a recommendation, some graft, or what have you, then give us your thoughts in the email. And from there, it'll be sent through committee after committee after committee, vetted and filibustered all the way until it reaches us, after which we will make very sure never to respond. Don't you just love when the system works? That email again is curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. Capital C, capital C, capital E, capital I at gmail.com. That's all the time we have. Thank you all for listening. And as always, good luck. And now to check on the team to see how they're enjoying their movie. So how's that bag of chips there, Dan? Shut up. The names, characters, and incidents used herein are fictitious. 
politics don't actually work this way. Sorry to disappoint you. Yours, the ghost of George Washington. I'm here, Jim. You're going to have any longer about this appointment. I'm going to have to see those committees. See those committees. Did he just chainy him? Yes. yes. It's nice to see politicians actually caring enough about scandals and corruption to try to hide them. There was a simpler time. <laughs> I wish my family greeted me like that when I came to the kitchen table. I walk in and they're gone. I'm just like, what do I eat? They don't look yeah. at me because they're not in the room. Yeah, they beat their kids a lot more back then, too. So that might have been a factor. I don't want my senator on a boat. I don't want my senator on a goat. I do not want him. <laughs> Sam, I am. I will not I have your green eggs and ham. Eggs and ham. <laughs> yeah, I will not have your green eggs and ham. Father, are you going insane again? It's, he's being assaulted by the internet. Oh, no. Oh, my God, he is. He's an old fuddy-duddy white guy getting blasted by fucking 12-year-olds on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> I think these young kids are the only people still alive from this movie. Um, maybe? I Surely some of them went to Vietnam. <laughs> I seem to remember a Tiny Toons cartoon that dealt with this. <laughs> He's a good old politician. He's great for America. He collects boys. Wait, what? And cats. He also collects cats. What was that last thing you said? I said he's good for America. Okay, the thing after that. He, he collects, collects cats. cats. <laughs> Between those two sentences. There wasn't anything. I don't know what you're talking about. He's good people. I wonder how they did that camera trick. I had to really do some really crazy editing stuff in uh in the 30s, Tosh. They didn't have the CGI we have today. Like that scene where he put the bowler hat on his head? He really put a bowler hat on his head. I'm looking for wires, man. There's got to be something behind that. Same with that. Like, that when you just took it off, he really is taking his hat off. Was that uh, star cocaine? Because it looked yes. like that with yes. cocaine. <laughs> it, was just... a great, it was a great depression. It was the only thing they had available back then. My God, Jimmy Stewart as a boy. Jesus Christ, he's so young. I know. It's like, what, I know. Barely. Ladies and gentlemen of the audience, this is why this movie was so hard to get to. Jimmy Stewart is young in this movie and he died in 98 and he stopped acting i think in the early 90s or the late 80s yeah his last movie was uh that he voiced he was a voice in the last movie he was in was uh american tale five goes west yes yeah and if if our audience is watching this movie or or will watch this movie after we've watched it you'll notice that everyone around young jimmy is very old so that's why this movie was so hard to get to they're very old and right now currently dead Mmm, yeah, liberty. Mmm, fuck yeah. I'm as erect as the Washington Monument. Fat, 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 fat. Senator walking around punching people? Specifically, reporters. Yeah, even George Washington says, you got your ass whooped. <laughs> I think she likes me. I think he likes Jimmy. Who doesn't like Jimmy? I'm not gonna lie. I'd probably be staring at him that way, too. I wish my wife would look at me the way that guy looks at Jimmy Stewart. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know she's not going to tonight. Yeah. <laughs> I like this explanation better when it was sung to me. I'm just a bill, a lonely bill, and I'm gonna die here on Capitol Hill. Interesting cinematographic choice. Is that a word, Tom? As someone who flunked out of the film program, yes. My dad went to his grave saying the worst thing that Washington, D.C. ever did was install air conditioners in the Capitol building. Because now the senators get to work all year round. <laughs> That's like 60 cents in today's money. Senator accepts graphs from kids. <laughs> <laughs> this is another good thing about movie making in the 30s. As I mentioned before, every time he drops his hat, he's actually dropping his hat. That's, that's not CGI. That's acting. Now, they had rotoscope back in the day. That hat's <laughs> totally animated. So are they going to bang? No, this is the 1930s. They're just going to stare longingly at one another. They might share a kiss. You might get to see her ankles. That's about as risque as it's going to get. This is rich. Politician mm. with a conscience. I told you, fiction. Hey, look, it's Mitch McConnell. <laughs> well, that deal with Satan's really helped him out. I got more done when I was punching people. I checked everywhere else, so I had a hunch you'd be here. No, that's called process of elimination. President, I did not say that Senator Payne was one of the congressmen in that room. I was in that room. Gasp! What? The media controlling the narration? Hmm. 
Fiction, Nigel! <laughs> Fiction! Okay, so what's the time frame here? How long has he been in Washington now? Uh, about 48 hours. <laughs> <laughs> Things moved pretty fast in 1939. The governor's own kids conspiring against him. Proper old school internet. I thought those were leprechauns at first. They are. It's black and white, Tom. Also, again, a testament to old school special effects. Those are real leprechauns. As we all know, leprechauns did go extinct in 1986. So they've been CGs ever since. Sweet fucking Jesus. Nothing's changed. Nothing has changed. It's just, it's on our phones now. That's just the only difference. Uh, the thing is, though... I feel like this is exaggerated for 1936, <laughs> but for 2020, this is toned down. How many times do you think he's peed himself? It can't smell good right there. Oh, God! Oh, my oh God. God! I forgot about that part. I didn't! They straight up murdered a car full of kids. Also, keep in mind, most of these kids are the governor's kids. That's the end? I mean, do you really want to see the actual, like, no, four months of... No, I think this is a good ending. I'm just, I'm surprised that's the end. This is a version I've seen, so if there's any more after that, I couldn't well, tell there, you. Well, there's, there's this, the after credit scene with Nick Cage, where he talks <laughs> about getting him into the Senate initiative. <laughs> you mean uh, Samuel L. Jackson? Yes, well... Yeah, if it was, it was Nick Cage, they were going to be stealing the uh, Constitution. Yeah, the Constitution, the yeah. Okay, maybe it's a two. Nick Fury, I think, is the one you were looking at. Yes, yes, yes. My bad. <laughs> yes, that is your bad. Tom, make sure that stays in the final cut. And now, back to the episode. <laughs> Does the senator yield the floor? For a question, I yield. <laughs> well, gentlemen, and especially Nigel, that was... Mr. Smith goes to Washington, our destination. And Josh, since I've been yielded the floor for a question, I will ask you, what was this film about? All right, so Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Let's see, it starts off with uh, us finding out that the senator from the state is dead and that the governor needs to appoint a new uh, senator in his place. So Mr. Jim Taylor tells him who he's going to appoint. He takes that to the people. The people say no. They give him a... Uh, person to appoint instead to which jim taylor says no so then the governor goes home talks to his children they give him the idea to send their basic scout master jefferson smith as the new senate appointee so he goes to mr smith's house finds that there's a lot of wayward boys there and cats and he appoints him so then mr smith goes to washington very early in the movie where he's, you know, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, and just in awe of all the monuments and everything. He gets his pictures taken for the newspapers, and then he gets basically an, a, a starch introduction to politics and the media, and they basically misquote him and frame him in the worst possible light. So he uh, goes and he punches every single one of the reporters who took his picture and did that to him. We all agreed that that was probably the best thing he could do. But then he wants to write a bill for a boys' camp, in his state. Little did he know that they wanted to build a dam that would solely uh, benefit the Jim Taylor, the billionaire who is the puppet master to the governor. He figures out about that and the whole collusion and all that good fun stuff that's happening. And he says something in the Senate, in which case his idol and long-term senator, Mr. Um, Joe Payne, immediately starts throwing him under the bus saying that he had owned all the land that he wants to make his camp from and he's gonna totally do it for profit. He goes through Senate committee, and then he's about ready to quit. And then his uh, secretary, Saunders, she uh, gives him this idea on what to do to possibly get his message out there and find a, what she calls it is a 40 foot leap into a tub. So it's like a long, a wayward shot, a very long shot that this could possibly happen. So basically what it is, is he goes in there, he gets the floor on the Senate and he filibusters for about 24 some odd hours. And he just goes into until the very end when he basically guilt trips Senator uh, Payne to the point where he feels like he can't do this to him anymore. He comes out and he tries to shoot himself in the head and he ends up coming out and says, everything he said is true, expel me. Right before then, Jefferson Smith passed out and then he's being carried out and then credits roll. Did I miss Hurry. anything? No, I think you hit the. I think you hit all of them. Nigel, what do you think? That's pretty good. Yeah, that was a good summary. 
Yeah, well said, Reginald. All right, so, Nigel, what is uh, your final thoughts on this one? Um, uh, really good. Uh, really, really, really good movie. I mean, it, it's definitely a product of its time. Like, it's got 1930s style camera work, 1930s style scoring and the music. But that's okay. That, that's what movies are supposed to be. They're snapshots into, actually more than snapshots into that particular period of time. No, it's a really good movie. Um, I thought, obviously, Jimmy Stewart was fantastic in it, but Claude Rains was brilliant, as he usually is in everything I've seen him in. And I love the completely realistic ending um, where a senator is called out on his corruption and is so racked with guilt that he uh, <laughs> tries to commit suicide. I mean, that was ooh, that was right out of reality. But no, in all seriousness, just what an amazing movie. And honestly, a really good cap off to this journey. Um, all serious and joking aside here, uh, politics are, especially right now, are kind of divisive. Actually, not kind of divisive. They are divisive. Um, and I've watched, in, in heartbreaking fashion, politics tear apart families and friendships over the last few years. And it's kind of nice to see this movie, which was made at a time where politics was contentious as well. I mean, 1939 was not an easy year for America. And this just have a positive, uplifting message, a positive, uplifting ending. I don't know. I just, uh, it, it's it's a good underdog movie. It's a, it's a movie where the wide-eyed, bushy-tailed idealist didn't come out jaded in the end. So... I kind of like it. Although there's no sequel, so we don't know what happened to Mr. Smith after he finally regained consciousness. <laughs> Probably know he woke up in the hospital and, and uh, looked over at uh, What's-Her-Name and said, that was a stupid idea. Why didn't um, you stop me? Yeah, why didn't you stop me 14 hours ago? But uh, I loved it. I love this movie. Um, like I said, I can't really say enough good about it. Tom, what about you? Honestly, that's kind of why I really wanted this film to be the destination and why I felt for the time frame we are in now, we take this road as hard as it was to get through. And it was a rough road just because so many of the films we did watch really hit home. Who boy, a lot of them. And this one too, Nigel, you've mentioned 1930s style, especially directing and story pacing to uh, Reginald. I'm sure you're going to mention us some of the technical stuff, but for me, as someone who had seen it and has seen this a few times to the point where he's like, I have to buy this film. It's not so much the story being said, but what's being said with the story that I felt really really needed to be just experienced the notion the parable of fighting for something you absolutely know in your heart is worth fighting for no matter the odds even when things are at their darkest you just keep fighting in that truth and justice and the American way, that Captain America, that Superman symbol. That's what I was really hoping to get out of this film, not just for me, but for the group of us here. And I'm glad at this moment in history, in 2020, as painful as it is that we are still repeating the lessons and the story that we still can look to this film and just be like Jimmy Stewart right there with you on that floor, man, fighting for that lost cause. So I'm not going to go into any more technicals on that. It's what this film represents and not just for me to re-experience it and just feel that again, but for all of us just to come around that. And for anyone that's watching or excuse me, listening to this podcast. I'm hoping that whether it's 2020 or 2024, or if somehow this gets knocked into like some weird kind of black hole and it gets broadcast back through the past, for any of you guys, just watch this film every two years. Just watch it again and keep that in mind. But Josh, as a guy who's went in blind, what did you see in this film? 
God, as much as you set me up to just come in and say hated it, I'm not going to. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure, Josh. <laughs> no, it was it was a great film. I got to say, I pro- I think I definitely enjoyed it more than. Do I want to say I enjoyed it over the past over this past three weeks? That this is probably the one I liked the most. I, I I'm gonna have I definitely got to uh, let it simmer a little bit and just date. But mm-hmm. uh, no, it was a really good film. It's like one thing that I think really stood out for me was the filibuster. I think one thing that we like to see as audience watching a hero do something that we couldn't do or something so epic, like him standing for 24 hours, rattling on. I look at that and I'm like, I couldn't do that. Or I, I have nothing in my life right now that I feel like I have that much motivation to do. So to see somebody up there portrayed with that level of a passion is something I would aspire to, you know? Mm hmm. It's like you said, that that's that American in us or in this movie. It's like he portrayed the hero. He was the hero in that he found this cause and he fought for it, you know? And I think it's like everything else was kind of secondary, I want to say. But it's just like, I, even looking at it, I felt like the uh, whole damn situation was kind of underplayed. It's just, it was like, it was there to be a plot device. Like, okay, they're going to make money off of this. They don't explain how. They just say, there's a dam. Uh, they mention a couple offhanded comments on how they're going to buy up all lands under fake names and then sell it back. So they are obviously doing this for profit. But they don't go super into detail. They don't have to do that level of exposition to us as the viewer. Once it's said, it's done. Mm-hmm. But then they see how brutally, how decisively they just beat down Jefferson Smith. Like, he didn't even see it coming. I think... I think All of our heads was spinning, and I know mine was, after Senator Payne came through and just said he was unfit for office. And I'm just like, holy shit. And I remember one thing I was thinking when they was doing the whole signatures, like, well, he didn't sign anything. I thought that. They even explained that, and that they had people coming in to check their handwriting. Like, this movie definitely went into the weeds with that kind of shit, too. But in the end, I thought it was a fantastic film. And I agree. I think it's something that everybody needs to watch at least once every two to three years. Mm-hmm. And for my end too, just I mean, let's now that we've all given our emotional, maybe a little more technical side. I know the actress that worked alongside Stewart, you know, wanted um, Clark Gable to be in it, or excuse me, Gary Cooper and Dean uh, Arthur. Yeah, that's the one. It's like didn't like Stewart's performance because he came off as weak and a little too doughy eyed and like starry eyed. I think that worked perfect for the character. I agree. Yeah, I think that like especially at the first part of the movie when he came to Washington, like, oh look, there it is. And everybody's like, What? The Capitol building. Like, yeah, mm-hmm. okay. We see it every day. But yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. And naturally flustered too, especially when it was with Payne's daughter. Like it mm-hmm. wasn't over the top. It was just enough to be believable. Well, I mean, for all intents and purposes, the way he was dressed, he kind of looked like Clark Kent without the glasses in the sense of like he was wearing like suits that didn't fit him quite right. And he was kind of slouched for a little while. And yeah, he uh, kept fumbling around with either his hat or putting his hands in his pockets. Very, very, very Christopher Reeve as Clark Kent. It wasn't until like the end of the movie, like he's all disheveled at the end of his filibuster. His tie's undone. He doesn't have his jacket on anymore. He's got his vest unbuttoned, but he's standing tall. He's not slouching anymore. He's got his shoulders back. So you can see like the confidence of the character growing as you watch mm-hmm. the movie. You know, I, I really like that about it. I think Jimmy Stewart was perfectly cast in this film. And no disrespect to Gary Cooper. He was a good actor too. But this role is Jimmy Stewart. And I don't know if we say that because he made the role so iconic we can't see anyone else in the role. But this is Jimmy Stewart's. We watched Flight of the Phoenix last week, and we all kind of agreed that a lot of people consider this movie a classic, but we considered it good, but not a classic. Mm-hmm. This this movie's like Jaws, like when we watched Jaws for me. This one is one yeah. of those that lives up to the hype. When someone tells you this is a classic, this needs to be on a must-watch, you have to see this film. This is like Jaws. This is one of those that like, you have to see this movie. And this one is more than worthy of its classic status. I love that it is... Uh, look back in time to 1939. It's kind of interesting to see the um, United States pre-World War II, as cliche as that sounds, that it, that changed everything. I don't know. It's just it's a really good movie to see in that light. This is a classic film and classic Jimmy Stewart. Yeah, mm-hmm. I agree. Like 
Jimmy Stewart, just the way he played off that kid visiting Washington, D.C. in awe of all the monuments, especially when he just kind of ditches his entourage. It's just you felt like he's just like, oh, this guy's going to get crushed. (laughs) Yeah, especially since he didn't have a prior career in politics, you know. I know the word naive went through my head multiple times. during. Oh, naive. (laughs) You actually put it perfectly, uh, I think, in your summary, bright eyed and bushy tailed. I would have said fresh meat myself yeah yeah uh, i like movies he's brilliant absolutely brilliant this was like what tom cruise was to talk on this was a movie that launched jimmy stewart into the stratosphere he got super popular super hot right around this time unfortunately world war ii breaks out in two years after this movie comes out and he joins the war effort doesn't act again until like 1945 46 yeah, he becomes um, actual top gun yeah but yeah, he, he had a very memo. long it's like you're just supposed to act <laughs> exactly but it worked though he had a really long sustained career after world war ii i mean we saw him in flight of the phoenix last week and i really hope we come across his movies again i hope to see some i would love to get to harvey someday like that's such a good movie oh god um, i've never seen harvey and i really hope we do at some point that's a that's a movie that can't be remade today because they'd have to show the stupid fucking rabbit they'd mm-hmm. have to show the rabbit it would be a dumbass cgi thing probably voiced by kevin james or some shit and it would just be terrible, and everyone would hate it, and it'd be an awful movie. But in 1950, it's it's classic. It's like, oh, this is such a good movie. I did have a question. Tom says it needs to be released like every 5, 10, 15 years. What are your thoughts on remakes? I know that there was a uh, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington TV show that ran 1962 to 63. Some people say that it was loosely remade by Eddie Murphy back in 92 with The Distinguished Gentleman. Do you think that they should remake this? Like, maybe not word for word but i'm genuinely shocked they have it i'm genuinely shocked especially since this movie came out in 39 when again great depression a lot of lost faith in politicians and then the tv show came out in the 60s when i think there was something going on in the 60s that was causing people to lose faith in government i can't remember so i'm genuinely shocked that some form of a remake hasn't come out now because yeah there's some stuff going on in politics that's causing a lot of people to say f this well, I do remember Simpsons, they had a whole episode where Mel Gibson was trying to remake it, and then Homer like said, hey, there should be a giant gunfight at the end. And I'll say, I think they should go with that version. Really, really get that modern audience. Yeah, in. let's get Michael Bay to remake this film. Oh, yeah, that'd be beautiful, wouldn't it? Oh, he, oh. Could, he, could, he could put it in the Transformers universe. It could be called Optimus Prime Goes to Washington. and it could just. Oh, I would vote for Optimus Prime. I, he actually would. Right now, yes. He's ineligible. Show us the birth certificate. I may have written him in the ballot yesterday. Doing your part, Dan. Doing your part. (laughs) But no, I honestly think that you could remake this movie today. Maybe not call it Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. There'd be a lot of stigma to just having that name associated with it. But you could keep Mm -hmm. literally all the characters' names the same. I think you could remake the movie, but you couldn't use the title. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can remake this film. I think that, for one... No Hollywood director would be able to stop themselves from not making it too heavy handed. It would have to have a message to it and it would have to browbeat that message all over your head again and again and again. And it would polarize a lot of people. Not saying that this movie wasn't polarizing <laughs> when it came out. No, no, let me preface that. This movie was polarizing when it came out, but mostly polarizing amongst members of the press of the Washington elite. The people actually liked this movie. It was a big hit. Mm-hmm. But the press thought that they were portrayed a little unfairly, <laughs> but now we know they were portrayed accurately. Now I could see things that they would change in a remake of this film for better or for worse. I definitely think that it would probably be a female lead. It would be a woman going to Washington and becoming a Senator and, and yeah, trying to change that. Congress or instead of a woman, it might be a, a minority black or Hispanic. And that actually would fit today's, landscape and mindset just like in 1939 you didn't have a lot of young men go into the senate even though the rules are i think you had to be like 32 or 34 or I something like that it's younger for the senate i could be wrong you have to check me you know, it's, it's okay it's for, for the right you're right you're right i think it's like in your 20s i think it's like in your 20s for the senate yeah but you don't see it too much you don't see a whole lot of young people go into the senate at least not in 1939 now we do see it we do see a lot more younger people in the senate and it seems to be tilting that way slowly but surely i just think that they wouldn't be able to be so open and Ended with the message or like they would change the issue like i felt that the damn issue was very generic as well i think it would be something more like you said polarizing yeah it would be definitely be polarizing it would be something like bad senator from whatever wants to knock down an orphanage to build up you know like it'd be something so egregious he wouldn't just be 
shaking hands of a millionaire or a billionaire trying to scratch his back. You'd have to be an outright villain instead of just maybe a misguided human being. Senator <laughs> Devil Satanson. Exactly, exactly. Claude Rains plays a quote-unquote bad guy in this film. But you kind of get the sense, especially towards the end, that he's not really a bad guy. He's just made a lot of bad decisions. But that doesn't... He's been bad, puppeted for so long. Yeah, and bad <laughs> decisions don't make you a bad person, per se. They don't. They do, mm -hmm. We're all flawed. Every human being is flawed. We all make bad decisions. It just kind of felt like Claude Rains' character was kind of like, not in over his head, but he'd been playing the game for so long, he forgot how to try and win. Mm -hmm. Just He's just staying alive in the game. And... That's kind of the vibe I get. Whereas I think if they did a remake, it, Claude Rains' character would be so egregiously evil or <laughs> corrupt, like beyond redemption kind of corruption. And Jimmy Stewart's character would be almost Mary Sue-like. They wouldn't be able to write any flaws in him. Um, Jimmy Stewart did have a couple flaws in this film. Maybe not character flaws, but like, you know, he was nervous around pretty girls and he dressed kind of frumpily. And he was short-tempered, well, he, he, too. He was yeah, short-tempered. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. right. That's right. He was short-tempered. He, was, he short was very naive. Like, yeah, you, very... I know I jokingly said that, but I mean, like, he had to have his secretary help him figure out how to write a bill. Yeah. yeah. But no, I think on that one, Nigel, I'm, I don't think they would make pain so much like this uber evil, but Taylor, well, Taylor in this film, he was pretty damn evil, but they would portray him as absolutely yeah just, he's like excuse me sirs i have to go flog an orphan right now it's the only way i can have my dinner um from my end though i don't think they would have to change too much once he gets to washington maybe trim some things down but honestly they probably would have fleshed out more of like when the governor shows up and offers him the job like they probably would show more of that they would have toned down the punching scene Yes, absolutely yes. There would have been a disillusionment with Payne's daughter because she was set up as a love interest early on. He was all like sparkly eyed, hat dropping for her. And she kind of threw him off on the reporter. They would have showed more of him realizing that she's about as plastic oh, yeah. as Payne. There would have been more of that. And I think there would have been more denouement after the whole filibuster scene rather than just oh, like, yeah. and he wins. Ta-da. There, yeah, there'd be uh, more definitely. of that. Yeah, yeah, they definitely would have exploited the romance aspect. Man, they kind of just dropped her like a bad habit in this film, too. It's like she was there one second, she was a pseudo plot device, and then nothing. They do. You don't really see her again after she calls up, uh, who was his assistant's name? Um, Saunders. Saunders. Yeah, Thank when you. she calls up, she calls up Saunders and says, hey, take him out shopping, get him a nice suit and uh good coat all this other stuff and then you don't really see her again i mean it, they definitely show the aftermath of jimmy stewart had gone to the party mm -hmm. because he's back in his office and all that but i think if they were to remake this movie today there definitely would have been a scene at that party and then they would have shown some scene with her kind of maybe not maybe jimmy stewart starting to see a little bit or mr smith i should say starting to see a little bit of the fakeness of her really the purpose of this film like i said was it wasn't so much the story but what you know they were trying to get across that mm -hmm. moral of the story so the rest was a jumping point but that's like 1930s <sighs> storytelling right there especially early capra oh yeah if they just took this film if they got the raw footage and was able to re-edit it i think that they would edit it up a lot more clean i think mm -hmm. modern day editing would be good for this film but i don't think modern day shooting would definitely yeah. not modern day acting yeah but these tiny quibbles and like little tweaks we see or the potential we see in it are not condemnation again for what this film is is beautiful yeah that definitely a big asterisk there we are not critiquing this film we're not saying what we would have done better we're kind of just making kind of a, a commentary on how hollywood would do it today yeah. based off of our limited experience yeah. i mean we do have 32 episodes of a podcast under our belt gentlemen <laughs> we do <laughs> we're we do. somewhat of experts in our field 20 more episodes and we will have been doing this for an entire year 2020 man yeah 2020 you know what though let's pat ourselves on the back we just got through another road this i mean what fourth one fourth one yeah yeah independence day jaws it and yeah, Mr. Smith. So God dang it. Has it already been six weeks since we've watched yeah. it? <laughs> yeah. Cat yeah. Jesus, yeah. It's been twelve weeks since we watched Jaws, you know? It's like yeah. It's this is been... how I separate my year now by journeys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like I said, we, we just completed our fourth journey. That to me is the most amazing part. And sometimes I do feel like I'm 
Mr. Smith and I just got done filibustering Congress for 48 hours mm-hmm. and I'm about to collapse from exhaustion. But on the other hand, I feel rejuvenated like Mr. Smith. You know, I love this podcast and I, I, I'm so excited about the fact we just completed our fourth journey. And then we've, we've we're, stuck we've with it, it for this long. <laughs> Woo-hoo! We've gone the distance. We held the floor. We're just flying high up to our next journey, aren't we, guys? Yes, we are. But uh, a- as always, as a reminder, you can find us on Spotify, iTunes, and Amazon, or wherever fine podcasts are sold. And uh, keep an ear out for our selection section number five. We'll be out on Friday the 13th. Scary sound. Ooh. That's what it says in the script. <laughs> some, some camp counselors might be getting Ooh. killed. Probably not. We're not doing Friday the 13th. But still. But yeah, our regular episodes will still be out on Tuesday at 6 p.m. So please like and subscribe on whatever medium you choose. We really appreciate it as it uh, helps us out. And also to help us out, be sure to join us on our Discord channel. Link in the episode's description on our site at firepit.podbean.com. You'll get notifications of new episodes and even better or worse, you can chat with us and other listeners. It's a fun time. You know what? We might even drop our next destination film a little early for the Discorders. Maybe, or maybe not, but maybe you'll just have to join to find out. No, Tom, we don't do spoilers. Our listeners have class. And uh, if you want to talk to us on anything other than Discord, you can always email the show. The email is mentioned always in the interspersal segment by Tom over here. So if you want to send us a message in essay format, hold on. Hey, Peggy. Uh huh. Yeah, I will. Thank you. Also, like our Facebook page and tweet us at, at FirePitCCE on Twitter. Both are linked in the episode's description on FirePit.Podbean.com. And I would like to give a special shout out to, um, well, my parents. Nick is still listening to the episodes. He liked our Cool Hand Luke episode. Yeah, that's all I got. Wow, so succinct. I you just, would go so yeah. far in a filibuster. I, that's why I have a lot of respect for anybody who can filibuster more than 15 minutes. I've never had to filibuster, so I wouldn't know. But I do want to use my time on the floor to thank Lane for joining us on our Facebook page. Thank you for popping in, Lane. Uh, I think we got a few other people whose names I do not have uh, in front of me at the moment. But I want to say... Thank you for joining, oh, nameless members of the Fire Pit Facebook page. We appreciate you joining us on this journey. Hopefully it's been a good one, and I look forward to having you on board for the next journey. And I will say, as always, a special shout-out to Peggy, friend of the channel, who is now much more than a friend of the channel. I think she owns the channel now. We're still trying to figure out what office we were running for. Also, special shout out to any of my new co-workers that are listening to the podcast uh, after asking me about it this week. I'll We're understand sorry. It. We're very sorry. <laughs> I'll understand if you want to move cubicles um, away from mine, or if you ask me to go sit in the empty part of the building on the other side. But thank you for listening. I appreciate it. So, Dan, what are we watching next week? I don't know. Well, why not? Because we haven't picked it yet. And besides, leave me alone. I'm trying to get quarters out of this phone booth. So um, I guess you'll hear from us again on selection section number five. A little bit of my... Every time. No! But I like that song. I've been Josh. And I've been Tom. And I've been Dan. Thanks for listening. This has been a production of Curtain Call Entertainment, LLC. Good luck out there. Um, okay, I, I think I can try that. Oh. You know I haven't been doing it this... You know I haven't been doing this... You know I haven't been doing this... this I, hang on, this is a bad, this is a bad connection. Hang on. I blame the writing. Five years of English, ladies and gentlemen. Five years of English. I'm just going to say that right now.